Hello. If I have not had a chance to say so to you in person, which I probably haven't, I want to wish you a very happy Easter. I'm not sure when you're going to be watching this video, but it is still the octave of Easter, and despite the fact that there is snow falling outside, we're still in this Easter season. We're in, in a very unusual Easter season, and we are still dealing with the COVID-19, and thankfully, uh, thank God, as well as thank for all the people that have been uh, adhering to the quarantine regulations. And I think that that has really made the difference to help limit the uh, medical impact on our community. So hopefully we continue to do as well as we've been doing and things don't get worse. But besides the fact that we're dealing with quarantine and uh, pandemic, a more immediate concern uh, an impact on us is the passing of Monsignor Dan. So not only have we lost a senior associate and a good spiritual friend, uh, his absence leaves us with a kind of unusual predicament for our partnership. And I've heard a couple of people ask the question or thinking out loud, are we going to get a replacement priest, uh, a priest to replace Father Dan? And the answer is probably not, and I would probably be opposed, or I am opposed to it for three basic reasons. First off, there really aren't any priests available. No one is sitting around on the bench, and even though we might be ordaining a couple of new priests this year, uh, this would not be a good assignment for a newly ordained priest. So even though we are um, in a very interesting time in terms of a partnership going through transition, it would be a great learning experience to look on your resume, it's also gonna be quite stressful, and that is not a good environment for a newly ordained priest. So odds are we're not going to be getting any replacement priest. Second reason I'd be against it is we don't have the finances to support it. Although priests aren't paid a lot, they are paid, and between their salary and the benefits that we pay to the diocese, it's tens of thousands of dollars that quite frankly, we at this point can't afford amongst our parishes. So. We'll talk about our financial issues in another video. And a third and perhaps the most important reason that I'd be against getting a replacement priest is we simply do not need another replacement or another priest in this partnership. We already have a need for more Indians and fewer chiefs. So although we have much to do in our partnership and there's going to be a lot of pro, uh, things for us to take care of, most of that work can be done by the lady, the people in the pews. And so priests aren't particularly well-trained for uh, administration, particularly in this very unusual, uncertain times. So the pool of talents might ri uh, rest in the pews uh, as much as any place. And so we don't need another administrator for our partnership. Priests are trained to do the sacraments, and we do have a need for the sacraments, but not as much need as we used to. So for the last three years, we've enjoyed the luxury of having six masses on a weekend. We've enjoyed the luxury of having Father Dan to help with funerals and weddings and sacrament of the sick. But in reality, if we take a look at our uh, October counts, we really do not need to have the six masses. And this has been a gradual decline over the course of time. So if you look at a graph starting from 2010 up till current time, the decline has been pretty gradual. Um, and so looking at our graph here, we have our three respective parishes listed out, but the top line is the one that I'm the most interested in. That is the total number of parishioners for all three parishes. And there's been a consistent gradual decline over the years. In fact, the pace, the rate of decline has actually picked up. So for the six years prior to the forming of our, our partnership, uh, we had lost 27% uh, over the six year uh, six year time. For the three years of our partnership, we've lost 32% more people. So the rate of decline has actually increased. And if you take a look at our actual numbers for the masses, they're not full masses. They're not uh, reaching nearly the capacity of the parishes in terms of seating capacity is concerned. So we've had these six masses with a nominal number of people attending uh, at each of them. 
And that's indicative of a, prob uh, a situation we don't need to continue. So in reality, we're going to be going down to three masses on a weekend for our partnership. And there's nothing real magical about that number. That's pretty well defined by some hard and fast rules. The first hard and fast rule is the fact that according to canon law, if a parish is still a parish and not a mission church or a secondary church, it is supposed to have at least one mass on every weekend to fulfill the Sunday obligation as well as any uh, one mass, at least one mass, on any holy day of obligation. So canon law says for our three parishes, each of them at least gets one mass. The second rule that plays into this is diocesan policy says that a priest is not supposed to be celebrating more than three masses on a weekend for the Sunday obligation. That doesn't include funerals or weddings, which typically will happen on a Saturday. And the reason for this regulation is to keep from burning out the priests. Uh, simply piling more masses on does not necessarily mean that you have uh, a greater flow of grace, and it certainly ha involves more wear and tear on the priests. So those two things kind of stipulate that we have three parishes, I'm allowed to have three masses, and we're going to have one mass at each of the three parishes. So that's the easy part of the equation. The hard part is to determine which parish gets what mass time. And so this is not a new situation. When we've dealt with it in the, in, in the past, when I've talked to the parish councils, everyone kind of understood that we were living on borrowed time, that there would come the day when we go from two priests down to one priest and we would have to modify our mass schedule. And people were okay with that, with the caveat that just don't play with my mass time. Don't change my mass. And there's this belief or expectation that a parish gets to vote on when its mass is going to be, uh, as if they are uh, having some entitlement by hosting it. The reality is that the mass does not belong to the parish. It doesn't belong to the people, uh, to the particular parishioners. It doesn't belong to the presider. It belongs to Jesus Christ. And it is a service done for the people of God. And we are in a community, so the masses are supposed to be for the community, not for a subset of a community. So I understand it's typical common tradition that we refer to my mass time as my mass and my parish as my parish, but that possessive uh, language needs to go away. It's not particularly helpful in our current times. So if we're going to have three masses, I think that we can break them up into some basic mass uh, timing schedules. The 4.30 seems to be a fairly popular time. And so that time is going to stay put at 4.30. We actually can't go before 4.30 without special permission from the diocese. And if you go any later than that, people will start to complain because they can't get into the restaurants because many restaurants in Erie do not take reservations. So people like to go to Mass and go right to the restaurant, and that 4.30 time kind of works. We have a number of Masses, or previously had a number of Masses that were spread out from 8, 9.30, and 10 o'clock. And I kind of lumped those together to say that that is a time that serves the bulk of the people. The third mass time is at 11 a.m. And the reason why I'm kind of protecting or keeping that mass time is because there are people that have a difficult time getting going in the morning, whether or not they're trying to get children ready or whether or not they're trying to get uh, elderly parents ready, or they themselves just don't get out, of the mor get out of bed as early and easily as they used to that does serve people that uh, do form a bulk or a, a certain significant number of our parishioners. So I want to keep that uh, mass time at 11. I don't want to go any later than that because otherwise you're cutting into lunchtime and then the, certainly people wouldn't want to attend for that. So looking for those three masses of 8, 9, 30, and 10, I'm taking the simple approach of simply splitting the difference and putting the mass at 9 a.m with the hope that some of the eight o'clock people will not feel that nine is too late and will attend, and that the 10 o'clock people won't think that nine is too early and will attend that, and the 9.30 people will be pretty comfortable just shifting a half hour. 
This chart shows a, an approximation of the numbers, assuming that no one is lost, that the people migrate to the mass that we kind of anticipate. And that's not going to be the case. There will be people that are at the 10 o'clock and think that the 9 is too early, so they might go to the 11. Or people at the 8 o'clock will continue to go to an early mass at another pair someplace else. So we're not going to retain all the people that we hope that we do, but the goal is to retain as many as we can. And hopefully people understand the circumstances that we're not simply changing the mass times to tick them off or to cause them inconvenience, but we're, we have to do what we can do. So the mass schedule in the locations will be, the 4.30 will be at St. Paul's, the 9 a.m. will be at Sacred Heart, the 11 a.m. will be at St. Andrew's, and the Holy Day Mass schedule can stay as it is, since we have one Mass at each of the three parishes, with 8 o'clock at St. Andrews, the 12.10 working Mass would be at St. Paul's, and the 5.30 at, St. at Sacred Heart. Weekday Masses will be here at Sacred Heart, for the simple reason, out of convenience for myself, that it's easy for me to walk out of my office, uh, into the church to have mass and walk back to my office and do mass in the midst of my working day as opposed to going to another facility. And I'm not sure of what the time will be. That will be announced at a later time after I get to talk to some of the people to find out what's the best compromise between the 8 and the 8.30 masses that were uh, previously serving those, those two groups. So in reality, uh, this is a starting point. I put out my best hope, my best guess, my best plan for a mass schedule that will serve the greatest number of people. Uh, but I do not have a crystal ball to know where people will migrate to or where they'll be feeling comfortable to go. So we may need to revisit this mass schedule uh, after we get uh, going and see what works and what doesn't work. Unfortunately, at this point, we do not have a time when we're going to reboot the public mass schedule or our public masses for the diocese. That will be announced at a, a future point, but I wanted to get the schedule out to the people so that they have it in their heads and minds and hearts that when we come back to our communities, uh, we're going to be doing so with a new mass schedule. And this is not the, the first change of our partnership. It's not going to be the last change of the partnership, but it is a significant change. I know anytime you mess with the mass schedule, uh, it impacts people. And so hopefully people will be uh, agreeable to continue to come to mass and we'll be looking forward to seeing you there. I know things are a bit of a mess, but just remember that every masterpiece looks pretty bad in the midst of the process. It isn't until the end that it all comes together. And so we don't know how long this masterpiece is going to take. We know that it's a work in progress. And I think that the, the key to success is to learn how to enjoy each and every brushstroke. Until we talk again. Bye.